Hey folks, you know when you have razor burn and you get those cheap razors and they nick you and cut you and there's all this irritation? Well, you can avoid that if you meet Henson Shaving. Henson Shaving is a family-owned aerospace parts manufacturer that has made parts for the ISS, the International Space Station, and Mars Rover, and now they are bringing precision engineering to your shaving experience. Razor blades are like diving boards. The longer the board, the more wobble. The more wobble, the more nicks, cuts, scrapes, etc. A bad shave is not a blade problem. It's an extension problem. By using aerospace-grade CNC machines, Henson makes metal razors that extend just 0.0013 inches, which is less than the thickness of a human hair. That means a secure and stable blade with a vibration-free shave. It gets better. The razor has built-in channels to evacuate hair and cream, which makes clogging virtually impossible. Seriously, Henson Shaving wants the best razor, not the best razor business. That means no plastic, no subscriptions, no proprietary blades, and no planned obsolescence. The Henson razor works with standard dual-edged blades to give you that old-school shave with the benefits of new-school tech. Once you own the Henson razor, it's only about 3 to $5 per year to replace the blades. That's the part, like, I mean, I, I don't use Henson, my fiancé does, and I think it's a great, I mean, I've observed that it, it really does not irritate him. Um, but also just the fact that, like, when I, you know, when we go to the drugstore, we don't even have to worry anymore about getting razors. Proprietary blades? Yeah, I mean, they're just, we're set. And, yeah. like, we have that 100 pack. I don't even know, I mean, like, when the next time we're going to need to re-up the subscription because it's just that good. It's a great investment for your shave and, honestly, for your pocketbook. Um, it's time to say no to subscriptions and yes to a razor that will last you a lifetime. Visit hensonshaving.com slash majority to pick the razor for you and use code majority. And you'll get two years worth of blades free with your razor. Just make sure to add them to your cart. That's 100 free blades when you head to hensonshaving.com slash majority. That's H-E-N-S-O-N shaving.com slash majority and use code majority. And now, time for the show. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. <laughs> and I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Thursday, April 18th, 2024. My name is Emma Vigeland, in for Sam Cedar, and this is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, Max Felker Cantor, author of Dare to Say No, Policing and the War on Drugs in Schools, and later in the show, Aaron Reed will be with us to talk about the much-discussed NHS cast report on trans-affirming care. Also on the program today, a Qatari outlet reports that the U.S. will approve a Rafah invasion in exchange for Israel not retaliating against Iran. Israel's already bombing Rafah, by the way, where over a million Palestinians are sheltering. Leaked diplomatic cables show U.S. plans to oppose the Palestinian Authority's application for U.N. statehood, contradicting its public two-state solution posture, which should remind people that two-state solution is a myth and not, not going to be feasible. Google fires dozens of workers who protested their cloud contract with Israel. A UN report on Palestinians in detention paints a graphic picture of torture, abuse, and sickening conditions. New sanctions announced against uh, Iran's, oh, I wish, Iran's drone manufacturers and steel industry because they responded to Israel bombing their consulate. The White House is considering declaring a national climate emergency. 
giving the federal government more power to combat the climate crisis. Experts and whistleblowers testified in two hearings surrounding Boeing safety standards yesterday. Disneyland actors have gathered enough signatures to unionize, reportedly. A new poll shows Biden's lead versus Trump with voters under 30 has shrunk considerably since 2020, their last matchup. Mike Johnson's latest Israel and Ukraine aid gambit appears to be on life support. And lastly, the Senate swiftly rejects the House's impeachment articles against Homeland Security Secretary Head Mayorkas. What BS that was. All this and more on today's Majority Report. Welcome to the show, everybody. It's an M Majority Report Thursday. It Happy is, birthday, it is my, uh, Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Matt. Um, it is my 30th birthday. I am 30 years old. Yes. Oh, God. Don't do those again, Bradley, Please, because sorry, people sorry. drive. Oh, um, gosh, <laughs> gosh. If you're listening while Not driving. Not the first time. Sorry, guys. Sorry, any motorists. Apologize. <laughs> Maybe delete those from the soundboard. <laughs> So please do not uh, oh, slam on your brakes with that sound effect. Although the drum roll was pretty good. Um, and we're getting some very nice IMs saying happy birthday to me. Uh, joint uh, jo- John in the in T-Berg says, Emma, I hope you had an incredible birthday. Um, but it, it's in process. But uh, kudos on the Dirty 30. It's the best decade because Charlie Kirk is no longer attracted to you. That's very that's that's good to know. Honestly, I've, I've hit that wall baby um anyway what's t-berg i don't know i don't know never heard of that i i I, john or it could be no i think it's john and t-berg john and t-berg let us know what t-berg means um so anyway thank you all for the the very kind birthday wishes i appreciate it we should have an extra fun fun half today um i'll be enjoying that very much but for now uh let's talk (laughs) let's talk israel i mean what else do we have on our brains um I, I don't know. I mean, th- this report in uh, by the UN <laughs> about Palestinian detainees. I mean, this is the quote from the New York Times, which, by the way, I think is adjusting very slightly. It has it's to cover posture. Ass. Yeah, it's a CYA effort. But like, I mean, the Washington Post. I just got to say, Evan Hill, forensics reporter over there, uh, Louisa Love Loveluck. Am I saying that right? great job at the Washington Post uh, putting putting the New York Times to shame. And it's not like they're reporting radically, right? It's not exactly how I would frame things all the time. But this is the the value of having an outlet like that, doing actually investigative work on Israel on what Israel's doing. Is, Instead is of good. focusing on having a style guide about how you can't say <laughs> occupied territories. Exactly. Um, but it's uh, this says Palestinian detainees describe described being made to sit on their knees for hours on end with their hands tied while blindfolded this is from this un report being deprived of food and water and being urinated on among other humiliations the report said others described being badly beaten with metal bars or the butts of guns and boots according to uh, the report or forced into cages and attacked by dogs there's also uh reports of these prisoners one of them described how an Israeli officer threatened to kill her whole family in an airstrike if she did not provide the Israelis with more information. Another said he was has been forced to sit on an electrical probe that burned his anus. Some freed Gazans told aid workers that they had been beaten on their genitals, aggressively searched and sexually groped. And the UNRWA report, the UNRWA report said women said they had been forced to strip in front of male officers. The report said suggesting that some of the incidents may amount to sexual violence and harassment. Still awaiting the breathless New York Times report on mass rape and sexual violence against Palestinians by Israelis. That's only actually um, actionable if it's a uh, object of Zionist propaganda for a massacre. As as public support for the war was waning, that it's not a coincidence. That that's How when cynical that, came that out. stuff was trotted out by those people! Absolutely disgusting. Um, so that's the latest on the uh, absolute horror in Gaza. Uh, but young people, as they always do. <laughs> Um, anti-war movements and young people, um, the, they, they go together like PB and J and with that comes mass suppression as 
uh, was the case in with protests uh, against the Vietnam War. There have been enormous demonstrations at uh, Columbia University. This is the se it's the second day in a row now that Columbia University students are uh, basically camping out, setting up tents on the South Lawn uh, in at Columbia in front of the Butler Library. They are uh, basically sitting in and Columbia typically doesn't close its gates to uh, out the outside. Basically, if you're in New York City, you can walk around Columbia's campus traditionally, no matter what. But now they've begun to close their gates uh, and pro-Palestine demonstrators seem to seem to think and rightly so that, that it's in response to uh, to their activism here. This is some of the footage of Columbia from last night. See if you're listening to the podcast audience, hundreds, hundreds of people dancing, waving pro Palestine flags. So that's what's happening on this coast. On the West Coast, in the news of uh, campus suppression and free speech, which, by the way, I've yet to hear anything from Barry Weiss and the free press. I mean, she is the free speech warrior, right? The most concerned national figure in this country. Or, you know, Dave Rubin, for that matter. Don't burn this book. All these censorious liberals. They have not, in, in my uh, estimation, said too much about... The uh, USC valedictorian here, Ansa Tabasum, I hope I'm saying her name right, um, who basically because pro-Israel groups lobbied USC to... She get, was smeared as anti-Semitic because get, of something yeah. she posted on social media that was not anti-Semitic. It's still available as a card. I've never heard of that before, but it's like a slideshow just with basic information about like what the one state solution is. And they got letters from uh, Zionist organizations and pulled her and citing safety and said that has nothing to do with free speech. If there is a safety threat to this, uh, to that, those proceedings, it is from Zionists. Oh, absolutely. Um, and and they've they they've put a massive target on this young woman's back, Horrible. who, by the way, has a minor, sorry, has a minor in genocide studies. Well, that's um, so offensive. And and so she's has this is exactly what academia is supposed to foment is supposed to engender somebody who uses her education to learn to to uh, basically pr uh, have expertise in this particular field and then gets to display the fruits of that education in her valedictorian speech and credit to uh abby Pillip here she or philip here she had a uh, a uh, USC valedictorian Asma Tabasum on to speak about what she would have said if she had been allowed to speak. Joining me now is Asna Tabasum, University of Southern California valedictorian. Asna, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, my understanding is that this week you met with university officials to address security concerns. What happened in that meeting? Did they tell you about any specific threats? No, actually, they did not tell me about any specific threats. And my request to ask for the details of such threats were denied. And so um, it, it leads me to consider whether the decision to revoke my speech was, on the ma was made on the basis of safety alone. Do you have a sense of whether there was a concern for your safety or perhaps the safety of other students? The safety, I think, is a priority for all students, including myself. Um, and so it was made unclear to me because I received no details about what specifically the security threats were directed to. So the university has said that this is not a free speech issue. Do you view it that way? I think there's a nuance here. I think. You know, I expressed an opinion um, through a link that I had on my Instagram. The hate and the vitriol that was unleashed towards me after, I think, was part of the reason that the university caved in. And so when it comes to being a free speech issue, sure, maybe my valedictory speech is a privilege. And it's a privilege I do not take lightly. And other students and evidently people around the world do not take lightly. but. At the end of the day, my views 
the views that I have expressed and the views that USC has instilled within me as well um, were, were stifled and were subject to hate. You just brought up a link that was posted uh, through your social media page. I, I do want to ask you about that um, since you did bring it up. One of the items in this post uh, calls for the complete abolishment of Israel. Is that a position that you endorse? If you're asking me if I stand for human rights, if you're asking me if I stand for yeah, equality... Yeah, we can, we can and, stop it there. I mean, I'll, I'll just characterize that part. That is, it, it is specifically saying that in a two-state solution, we all know the problems with that. That's pretty elementary. Let's move on to the problem. It's racial with the, segregation. Exactly. A problem with a one-state solution is like, if that one state is Israel, Israel is a settler colonial state that wants that for, ex for exclusively Jewish population. So... The actual thing, and I went over this in Left Reckoning, but the language was saying we need one state for Arabs and Jews, Muslims, Jews, everyone to live together without this sort of project on top of it. So when she says, should Israel exist, should a exclusively Jewish state exist? And the answer is no. Yes. And by the way, states don't have inherent rights to exist. People have rights to exist. And when states commit things like genocide, there should probably be a uh, some sort of reckoning in the sense of like a complete reimagining of what that state would look like. And that includes, you know, did South Africa have a right to exist as a white uh, a white uh, state? No. Um, and in the same way that Israel doesn't have the right to exist as an ethno state, and especially one that is being fortified by m billions of dollars in military aid by our by the world superpower. But I actually do want to hear her, the, what she has to say a little bit. Unequivocal and unconditional right to life for all people, including Palestinians, then I'm not apologetic. I believe in what I believe, and it is because of the people around me that I've met at USC, the classes that I've taken, the professors that I have learned from that have led me to look at the world in this way. And, you know, it's, an, it's unfortunate that, you know, human rights is controversial. The reason I'm asking is because that's what the link said. It, it called for the complete abolishment of Israel. Okay, abolishment credit, credit of removed. Israel was in the yeah. actual language. Is that something that you endorse? So the abolishment of the state of Israel, I'd like to clarify, is the abolishment of an apartheid system. It inherently is a system that subjugates Palestinians as dehumanized, and it subjugates Palestinian life as not worth the same as other human life. So, so that's when a, the link says... So that's, calling, is that a yes, then? I think a yes or a no would be an injustice to the issue. And I think that any sort of ideological debate or any sort of academic discourse is worth clarification and worth discussion. You're there you go. Just to read the actual language here that Abby Phillip... I Who I was about... I mean, I hadn't seen that part yet. So. Bring that energy to the IDF people you have on, Abby, would be my advice. But um, I'm sure the there's producers in her ear being like, Get, push back, push back, push back. So. I'm not sure. Yeah. The one state solution, either this is what it says, either a Palestinian state or a complete Israeli state advocates for one state in which both Arabs and Jews can live together. However, a one state solution under the Israeli government would essentially mean that the Palestinian people would be completely under the state of Israel in every way imaginable. One Palestinian state would mean Palestinian liberation and the complete abolition of the state of Israel. That is the only way towards justice. Both Arabs and Jews can live together without an ide ideology that specifically advocates for the ethnic cleansing of one of them. Palestinians would be allowed to return home and millions of Palestinians would not have to live under occupation and apartheid. Where's the lie? Yeah, I mean, she's absolutely right. But let's also point out that the, the fact that she's wearing a, a, a hijab the fact that she is a uh, Muslim American person is inherent to this as well. Also biomedical engineering valedictorian. I know. Well, she met all of the criteria, but this Zionism is a racist project and it's r deeply racist and Islamophobic against Muslim people. And so... And how dare we in a country that champions free speech let this sort of thing influence things like graduation season. It's an absolute generational failing. And it, I hope that like this is the last generation it's allowed to happen. Absolutely. Um, and th calling it what it is, a racist decision by USC, I think is the way to actually frame this in an honest way. But CNN chose not to go down that road, obviously. 
All right, we are going to be speaking to Max Felker Cantor in just a second. But first, a word from some of our sponsors here. Urs, uh, Urs, Earth Breeze Eco Sheets look just like a dryer sheet, but it is ultra concentrated liquidless laundry detergent. Detergent. It is the best of all worlds. Earth Breeze is tough on stains and odors while being kind to the planet and your skin. And Earth Breeze has a deal for you. Right now, you can subscribe to Earth Breeze and save 40%. Go to earthbreeze.com slash majority to get started. We would like to thank Earth Breeze for supporting our show. Earth Breeze is great, especially if you're in an apartment or if you're just the kind of person that likes to save space. I mean, who doesn't like that? Just the fact that it's like just little slivers like dryer sheets. You can put it anywhere. You don't have to have those big plastic jugs from... Uh, from the grocery store, from the pharmacy, or wherever you're you're picking up your detergent. And it's also good for you and good for the environment. EarthBreeze Eco Sheets are dermatologist tested, hypoallergenic, and free of bleach, dyes, and parabens. There's also a fragrance-free option if you're sensitive to smells like somebody named Samuel Cedar. That would be perfect for it. EarthBreeze, and, and I know that's why he uses it. EarthBreeze uh, got rid of unnecessary chemicals for a formula that is sensitive, kind to sensitive skin of all ages, including babies. No more heavy lifting or measuring sticky blue goo from a massive plastic jug. EarthBreeze's lightweight cardboard packaging takes up a fraction of space in your laundry room versus traditional detergent. EarthBreeze offers flexible subscriptions delivered via carbon offset shipping right to your door for free. Because unfortunately... You'll never run out of uh, laundry, but now you will also never run out of detergent. I think you should give it a try, and if you decide to go back to your old stuff for some reason, you will get a full refund and your Earth on your Earth Breeze purchase, no questions asked. These tiny sheets can stop millions of detergent jugs from entering our ecosystems. In fact, 500 million detergent jugs end up in landfills and oceans every single year. 91% of single-use plastic does not get recycled, including the stuff that we put in our recycling bins. And scientists say that the ocean will have more plastic in it than fish by the year 2050. That is horrible. And also, that is factually true. We had a guest come on to talk about um, the, the, these new revelations about uh, single-use plastic recycling being an effort by climate polluters uh, and, and their lobbying efforts. Making a positive impact in the world doesn't have to come at a cost to you. My clothes are clean. I think I smell pretty good. And I feel like I actually did something good just by doing my laundry. Right now, my listeners can receive 40% off EarthBreeze just by going to earthbreeze.com slash majority. That's earthbreeze.com slash majority to cut out single-use plastic in your laundry room and claim 40% off your subscription. And lastly... One of our favorite sponsors, Sunset Lake CBD. We know what's coming up on Friday or Saturday. It's 420, and there's a sale associated with Sunset Lake CBD. Um, so, I mean, uh, it's 30% off everything uh, statewide. It, it starts on, uh, I guess, I started on April 8th, and now it ends Monday, April 22nd. Statewide? Yeah. Okay. Uh, the uh, coupon code 420 it applies automatically um the the you can use it and you can get 30 percent off um and 20 percent of the proceeds will be donated to the last prisoner project uh and we the majority report is going to match it so uh sunset lake sebede and majority report last year raised twenty two thousand dollars for the last prisoner project a nonprofit organization dedicated to cannabis criminal justice reform and we are uh, sunset lake is running it back this year Starting today, everything at Sunset Lake, sebede.com is 30% off with the coupon code 420. And if your order is over $100, they will throw in a free 20-count jar of their Vibe gummies. Sunset Lake is going to donate 4.20% of their proceeds from this sale to the Last Prisoner Project, and Majority Report is matching it. I, I mean, I I've said this so many times, but I basically use those sleep gummies every single night. They're really helpful for me to go to sleep, especially if my mind is racing. Um, I love those vibe gummies are great as well. The ones that are focus gummies, I should probably use one of those today, actually. Um, they're really awesome. They have the little tinctures, they have the smalls, they have keef. You can grind it up and put it with other products that you may be smoking. 
Sunset Lake, it's great, great Sebede and all of that. Um, it's not the junk that you can't count on. It really does the trick. And uh, they're having a sale. It ends on April 22nd. Go to sunsetlakesebede.com to take advantage of this deal and help raise, raise money for cannabis criminal justice reform. See their website for sale terms and restrictions. All right, folks, quick break. And when we come back, we'll be speaking to Max Felker Cantor. <laughs> are back and we are joined now by Max Felker Cantor, Associate Professor of History at Ball State University and author of Dare to Say No, Policing and the War on Drugs in Schools. Uh, Max, thanks so much for coming on the show today. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me. So uh, you, you've written a previous book um, on basically the police state, uh, uh, cops, and and um, did a lot of work in LA on that, on that book in particular. Um, you know, why did you choose to turn to dare now? Because like right. people have those dare t-shirts now and they wear them ironically, but <laughs> it really was this massive move. I mean, even when I was coming up, uh, going to school in the nineties and early two thousands, right. And uh, as a younger kid, uh, we had, uh, dare officers come or police officers come mm -hmm. and speak about the dare program, but it was so massive in the eighties and nineties. Yeah, it really was. And I mean, the reason why I came to write about D.A.R.E. is that when I was finishing that first book you mentioned, which was called Policing Los Angeles, I came across all this material about D.A.R.E. in these LAPD kind of archives that I'd been using in the mayoral archives in Los Angeles. And I was like, whoa, what did D.A.R.E. started in L.A.? And so I sort of that's where I kind of got the idea of thinking about because the same thing I did D.A.R.E as a kid in the early 90s, not in Los Angeles, and was like, how did D.A.R.E. get from L.A. to my school and then everywhere else that, you know, kids were wearing T-shirts, wearing it ironically later, you know, by the late, two, late 90s, early 2000s. And so I really just wanted to investigate, like, how did this program grow to become so big? Why did it start in Los Angeles? And like, why did the police want to kind of put police officers in schools as teachers is sort of where I started this whole program project, excuse me, and to think about the role that D.A.R.E. played in the 90s, 80s and 90s and the culture and politics of that era. And I mean, it, this is when the war on drugs is in full swing, right? I mean, we it, it started yeah. in the 70s, mm -hmm. ramping up aggressively mm -hmm. so in the 80s and 90s. And it's not a coincidence, obviously, that as we begin to incarcerate more people for drug use and selling drugs that this comes into the fold yeah no not at all like i mean dare like when it starts under daryl gates the kind of you know infamous lapd chief of police you know they are in the midst of this aggressive drug and gang war in in the 1980s and it's not a, and i the point i make in the book is it's not a coincidence that they're like we need this alternative program to also try to address what they called the demand side of the drug war and to, to tell kids how to prevent drug use, not just arrest everyone, but to prevent it. And so, but the, the, the point that we can see, I think through D.A.R.E. and the use of police officers is that it was never entirely like an alternative to this other drug war that's going right. on. As you mentioned, it's, it's actually like another police led project that starts to define what we might see as like social or health, you know, related problems in that are ones determined and defined now by the police as, as criminal ones or as carceral ones. And so it's, it's um, defined or it's kind of sold to the public as this alternative, but it doesn't really operate that way. And in part, that's because as I, as I suggest, it's that relying on police officers to, to be teachers and those police officers are in uniform while yeah. they're in the classroom, right? right? So it's not like all that different, It's but it's meant to kind of at the same time counter the very image that the police were kind of portraying on the street. Or you could see if, as you know, probably the nightly news with these 
drug raids, right? It's kind of militarized. This was meant to kind of soften the image of the police in the minds of kids. And, and my recollection was just feeling scared. Uh, I'm scared of drugs, scared of what they mm -hmm. were saying. Um, and, you know, there really could have been an alternate vision for this of restorative justice and education but it's but it's it's decide you know it's a link to right. police that and they made that at the forefront yeah exactly you know it's a, and that's a very similar memory to what i had right when i came out of it was like i'm scared i'm you know i had this memory and i write about this in the book a little that for me it was also it's those other kids on these kind of other parts of town that are kind of make you join a gang if you don't do this right so it was yeah. like fear about that fear about drugs um and this fear of like consequences right if you do drugs you could you know it could result in you could die right i saw workbooks from from people who shared their workbooks with me still filled out from when they were kids where they're like what's one of the consequences of drugs you could die you could be arrested right you could go to jail right and that's the lesson the kids were getting and so it's that kind of creation of fear um, about those consequences and so even as it's portrayed as that alternative, it's still within that zero tolerance um, kind of model of zero tolerance of drug use. And it is totally, as you suggested, not you know the kind of harm reduction, restorative harm reduction, justice right. that we've kind of come to more recently that the Drug Policy Alliance and others have kind of promoted. And so it's, it's a very different program in the 80s and 90s when it's just like, no drug use, right? If you make the wrong choice, you know the consequences. And so it's that kind of idea of personal responsibility as well. If you make this wrong choice, here are these kind of alternative, you know, consequences that you will face. And and it's really very much an aside, but there was so much media at that time that was like family friendly. Um, mm -hmm. You know, my my era was like Secret Life of the American Teenager or Seventh mm -hmm. Heaven. These shows where it depicted <laughs> right. you smoke a doobie and you are not only delinquent, but you might die as well. I mean, like that was mm -hmm. a lot right. of what was being pushed. <laughs> and I associate all of that, of course, with with Dare. Yeah, I mean, that kind of messaging all gets wrapped up in D.A.R.E. You know, it's part of this larger ecosystem of, you know, the Partnership for Drug-Free America and like the the commercials, right, that everyone remembers yeah. of like, this is your brain on drugs. <laughs> um, you know, D.A.R.E. partners with Hanna-Barbera Productions and they have Yogi Bear as their kind of spokes bear. So they're in all of that kind of popular culture, cultural production to shape those messages as well, you know, alongside Nancy Reagan's Just Say No and all of the stuff that's going on with that. And so it's it's all of that kind of um, popular culture media production to kind of shape what, what the Reagan administration at the time called, they wanted to de-glamorize drugs and they wanted to do that through media they enlisted athletes right there partnered with athletes and other entertainers to try to kind of shape that image as well so it's 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 keying into all those kind of trends of that moment so i guess you, you know you mentioned at the beginning how the lapd started the drug program take us or the dare program mm -hmm. excuse me take us through that uh the origins and how it kind of came mm -hmm. to be yeah, I mean, this is fascinating moment um, in it. So D.A.R.E. begins in 1983. It, the first kind of pilot class is the fall of 1983. But before that, Daryl Gates, the LAPD chief, um, in the early 1970s, mid 1970s, they had already started a drug war in L.A. schools. And they did that by putting undercover officers into high schools to try to arrest drug dealers in those schools. And after about 10 that's years- the, That's the premise of 21 Jump Street, yes, right? It is. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But it actually happened, right? They actually okay. had officers going into schools arresting, um, you know, sometimes arresting students, but often it was, it was meant to be targeted at quote dealers, right? But kids get wrapped up, all those sorts of things. By 1983, the winter, they come, Daryl Gates comes to the school board and says, We've been doing this program for almost a decade and it hasn't reduced drug use <laughs> among kids. <laughs> and so he's like, we need an alternative. And his alternative that he, they work out over the summer of 83 is with the LAUSD, that Los Angeles Unified School District, to develop this new program of police-led drug prevention. Because they're like, well, we haven't been able to stop the supply of drugs and people are still using. <laughs> but so now we're going to deal with the demand and we want to do that 
by creating a curriculum that will be taught by uniformed police officers. And so they start that program in 1983 in the fall um, in that first pilot year um, in about 50 elementary schools. And then within about two years, it's in every elementary school in Los Angeles. And so they expand it very quickly. And it's that story of that origin of um, what I call, it's an origin story that I call as a, is that D.A.R.E. is a product of failure, of police failure, because their kind of traditional strategies of arrest and trying to do these undercover operations didn't work. And so then they reroute and find a new avenue to try to wage this drug war by kind of another means. And so that's this origin story. And then, of course, from L.A., Daryl Gates was very intentional of, of saying, I am going to try to expand this program nationwide. And he's writing about it and he's going to conferences and he's talking to other law enforcement um, administrators and officials to promote the program. And so that's how it accelerates really quickly. Yeah. And and it also, as you uh, mentioned, it, it served both to cover up the failures of the drug war, but also to present a different image of police officers, which is interesting mm -hmm. um, right. because right. then there's there's already an understanding baked into it that police officers need a PR need a need some a, a rebranding at, in the context of this drug right. war and what they're doing, what they're really doing. Totally right. And it's like, and they don't like, you know, and the rebranding is they, what they eventually start to say is, well, the reason why we need these police officers as teachers, like the argument on the face of it was often, they know the sort of the stories from the streets, they're veteran officers who know all the stories and, and kids will believe them. And so the point I make in the book is like, these, these fifth graders, because it went into fifth grade classrooms, must have been so savvy about drugs that their normal classroom teachers couldn't tell them, like, let's have some health education around this, right? That they, that they needed police to be the kind of experts that the kids would believe. But then they start always talking about how what the police officers are really doing is becoming the friends and mentors to kids, right? And so what you start to see is very early on the officers wouldn't would stay on the school campuses for recess and play with the kids some of them started things like dare track clubs or coached football teams in the kind of extracurricular moments um you know at times after school and so it's sort of creating this image of like police officers aren't just here to arrest you they're here to help you they're here to kind of be your mentor right. and guide you and that's one of the things that even everyone starts saying in these early evaluations is oh, the kids start to say they have more respect for the police or they follow rules better or they're more disciplined right so there's this kind of disciplinary message to that kind of shift of image that isn't kind of it's not on dare's kind of promotional material but it's really kind of what's happening underneath and um, you, you talk about it as the a part of the school police nexus, right? You you uh, mm -hmm. use that that phrase. Um, right. How how do you how do you feel that this contributed to a lot of what we see today with school mm -hmm. resource officers and cops in schools? We have a pretty big problem of of specifically mm -hmm. in poor uh, minority neighborhoods, cops arresting kids in schools and then furthering them down this cycle of incarceration and of poverty um this clearly i think was a, a gateway to that reality that we live in now yeah no and i use this school police nexus framing as you suggest as a way to think about not just like the school to prison pipeline that many people are familiar with but to see like schools and police actually working together right, right. because they're they're working kind of in tandem and kind of in a reciprocal relationship because they're partnered in this it's not just like imposing they're actually they 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 sign memorandum of agree of of agreement to work together in these with these dare programs um and it but it's an entry as you suggest to this larger kind of longer cycle that we see because what I argue and what I think D.A.R.E. does, because there were police in schools before this, police athletic leagues, kind of like officer friendly, but D.A.R.E. brings these officers in on a kind of regular basis for 17 weeks and it normalizes the police in schools in the ways that those prior programs didn't do to the same extent. 
And it's before you get school resource officers, which come later into the 90s. And so D.A.R.E. kind of sows the ground of normalizing the idea of having uniformed officers on school campuses. And then originally, D.A.R.E. officers in the 90s were not school resource officers. They were meant to be separate because they're like, we need the D.A.R.E. officers to be the friendly, nice mentor. Mm. But later, post Columbine um, and, the, and the shooting there, they start to then say, we need to actually have all our D.A.R.E. officers be school resource officers as well. So over time, by the late 90s, early 2000s, they actually merged to where they say, we should actually have the D.A.R.E. officers be school resource officers. And so they become kind of that dual kind of role where they're both enforcement, but then also supposed to be these teachers, right? And so it facilitates that kind of continued um, presence of police in schools that has the kind of long-term um, effects that you're suggesting about the kind of arrest of kids, the racial um, inequality of those arrests of kids in schools, um, the disproportionate policing of, of kids of color, right, and marginalized communities, right, that all kind of right. fuels on it um, as well. So how did D.A.R.E. get its funding from its outset mm -hmm. to, you know, I guess when it kind of became a national program? Yeah, no, I mean, so at its outset, Daryl Gates kind of siphon, not siphons off, but kind of like says, I'm going to use some of my budget and rededicate officers. And he has this whole gripe with Mayor Tom Bradley, who's the first African-American mayor of the city uh, in Los Angeles, where he's like, Dar Tom Bradley's not giving us the resources we need for this great program. We're doing, we're kind of sacrificing our, our, our own police, you know, to go do this. Um, so he frames it that way. And eventually the city that, you know, they, they then, it becomes this citywide um, program that's funded, you know, through the police department. But they start actually, the, one of the initial things they start doing is applying for federal grants through the Bureau of Justice Assistance. And they start to get these initial seed grants in the mid 1980s, 84, 85 you know, in the realm of like $200,000 and then a $500,000. And that helps them start to actually build out a curriculum and training programs that they then will then that will use to spread the program. So that's one. But they then and then eventually the other federal funding comes in through the anti drug abuse acts of 86 and 88, which is the one that most people know that set the mandatory minimums and the crack to powder, you know, ratio, the 100 to one ratio. Um, that many people know. But there's a part of that law that is called the Drug-Free Schools and Communities Act, and it sets aside money for prevention. And D.A.R.E. starts to get money through that act. And gotcha. by 1990, when they do a revision, an amendment to that act, D.A.R.E. is actually named as a model program that other people could follow. And well, so they're getting federal funding. Yeah, I'm um, just I'm just wanted to, to jump in there because you really mm -hmm. could see an alternate model for having money for drug prevention. I think that that is actually a, a, a great goal. But um, mm -hmm. it, my my understanding is that when uh, the drug war started early on, actually, Nixon included more funding uh, in his, mm -hmm. its initial outset right. for prevention programs. But it increasingly got cut into by more um, right. Uh, basically police and, and uh, criminalization efforts. Yeah, and exactly. And you see that happen actually in 19, in the 1980s, like these 1986 Anti-Drug Abuse Act, um, if in the hearings where you have people like Charles Rangel and others, you know, um, Augustus Hawkins, who's a representative out of Los Angeles, and they're talking about, we need prevention, we need education. And you have William Bennett, who's the Secretary of Education at the time, going to these hearings, and they're all kind of and talking about this. And they've set aside only initially $200 million out of a kind of, you know, billion dollar drug war funding. And so that's very small, even as they're sort of promoting, look, we've included prevention now, but it's like totally disproportionate <laughs> to what they're spending on kind of the militarized side, the punitive side of the drug war. Um, and so that dynamic is worked out, but, um, and it grows a little bit over time, the prevention stuff, but it never kind of comes to the same, um, is never anywhere equal, right, to the kind of punitive funding of police, of border interdiction, of, you know, source country kind of policing um, and, and, Militar militarization there, so it, so that inequality remains. But Derek does is able to tap into some of that federal funding, and then there's another source of funding we could talk about as well, 
sure. um, not just federal funding. It's um, these. Uh, that, it's a nonprofit model, right? Yes, essentially, exactly. yeah. Yes, because what they do, in part, in LA, is they start to ask local businesses and local kind of, um, you know, foundations and others to 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 give donations to to a kind of community prevention council um, that eventually f funnels money largely to Dare. So they start getting checks from many of the Hollywood studios, from a number of corporations in the city. And so they start getting kind of corporate sponsorship into this nonprofit organization that eventually becomes what, what, it, what is called Dare America, which is an organization, a nonprofit organization that still exists. Um, it gets established in the mid to late 1980s um, as a nonprofit. It starts as Dare California. It's a little more complicated than that, but for, for this purpose. And what they start to do is promote Dare as this, you know, for corporate responsibility. Corporations start saying, look, we're gonna fund DARE. Look, we're backing this great prevention program. <laughs> and they start to funnel kind of corporate sponsorship into it. And so like, for example, one of the first national sponsors is Kentucky Fried Chicken, where they're like, <laughs> where they sponsor the DARE program. And so, and then you get a whole range of others just kind of constantly. And then and as DARE spreads in different states, they have these different dare organizations in each state that are working with local communities to get funds as well and and to get fundraising that way and it's an interesting kind of flip because what it allowed dare to do by the early 90s when we know that kind of quote big governments under assault right mm -hmm. even by the clintons is they said well we're not a government program we don't get that much money from the government but they're actually getting all this corporate sponsorship and that's how they kind of use it. The thing they leave out is all the local police departments are donating their officers time. So it's actually most of that kind of resource is coming from public money because they're getting all the police officers are donated time to do that instruction, but they write that off as donated services, not as funding. Interesting. Um, and, and so where lastly is the program at now? Is it basically just mm -hmm. existing in that, nonprofit model uh, space yeah it still is a nonprofit you know today and still exists it's near it's nowhere near the kind of same sort of ex um, kind of expansiveness as it was in the 90s it goes through a whole series of crises in the 90s when all the social scientists come out and say actually you know this program doesn't prevent drug use <laughs> <laughs> and so it comes under kind of fire for that um, and it goes through these revisions. And so Dare America still exists within that kind of nonprofit realm. It's still a nonprofit. There's also a wing of it called Dare Worldwide because it went international as well. It's located in Culver City as the headquarters, right? So it's in, which is, a, a part, you know, in the kind of Los Angeles area. So it still exists in that kind of realm as well. Well, fascinating stuff. And mm -hmm. I really appreciate your, your time today, uh, Max Felker -Can Cantor. The book is called Dare to Say No, Policing and the War on Drugs in Schools. We will put a link to your book in the description uh, and wherever people are, are listening or watching this and at majority.fm. Thanks so much, Max. Great. Thanks for having me. All right, folks, quick break. And when we come back, we'll be talking to Aaron Reed about this report that's making a lot of headlines, uh, misleading headlines, honestly, uh, out of the NHS in the UK. Be right back. <laughs> We are thrilled to uh, welcome back to the program Aaron Reed, journalist covering LGBTQ plus legislation and news and proprietor of the Aaron in the Morning Substack. Aaron, thanks so much for coming back on the show. Thank you so much for having me on again. 
Uh, it's good to see you, and I couldn't think of anybody better to explain what the heck is happening over there in England, because um, there has this this widely discussed report, the subject of some headlines, because uh, the Harry Potter author, turf in chief J.K. Rowling, said she would never forgive Harry Potter stars Daniel Radcliffe and Emma Watson for supporting trans people now that this study has has come out, and a lot of anti-trans people are are speaking about this as if it's this kind of um, smoking gun about trans-affirming care for minors. Um, but this, based on your piece uh, in, this morning in your sub Substack, Aaron, in the morning, which I'd encourage everybody to read, that's incredibly misleading um, because of reasons we'll discuss. But I guess let's start at the beginning. Um, what is this CAS review, this CAS report? Who is Dr. Hillary CAS? And... Uh, what's happening uh, as it relates to this study. Okay, so let's set the scene. It is 2020 and the anti-trans hysteria was sort of on the rise in England. We got to see people like JK Rowling come out against transgender people and we got the very first indications of that. Meanwhile, um, turfism is its trans exclusionary radical feminism, a form of radical feminism that excludes transgender people, which has a very strong strain in the UK is growing there. And we start to see wait lists get much higher for trans people in the country. Uh, we start to see teens and adults even have five-year wait lists to obtain care. And so it was under this politicized environment with the uh, Minister of Equality, with the, uh, we saw the Prime Minister at the time as well, started saying that we should just stop giving trans youth care. We should stop this, we don't, we don't want this. And so NHS England tapped uh, Dr. Hillary Cass to do a review. And this review was selecting a certain number of experts, quote unquote, that were not actually experts on trans care. And in fact, it excluded anybody who had any sort of expertise in dealing with trans people um, specifically, and it was designed to do so. And over the course of four years, we started to get study leaks that this report was gonna come out eventually and that it was gonna be uh, targeted at transgender people. Now, it was, said to be an independent review. That was what it was supposed to be, a, a review that was completely independent, that had no sort of ideological bias. And yet, Dr. Hillary Cass, very early on, we found, was following groups like Transgender Trend, LGBT Alliance, groups that essentially say that being trans is a trend, that we should drop the T from LGBTQ people. And then in 2022, we discovered via court documents that she was working with Governor Ron DeSantis's medical team in Florida to help ban care in Florida in a very similar way to what they are doing now in the UK. And then of course, we finally get this report, which says all the things that we expected. It's, there's not enough evidence that trans care doesn't work, that you can catch the gay from trans people, that you could turn trans just by being associated with us. That, I mean, the, these are, putting aside the fact that these are just recycled homophobic tropes uh, that had been deployed, um, how why is this the coverage of this review not leading with the fact that she worked especially in the US when I'm seeing US papers talk about it that that's an obvious link where you could basically say this person clearly had a preconceived idea before conducting this review i mean your your piece in your substack talks about how she was following anti trans accounts on her social media um was engaging with anti-trans uh, basically posts and things like that and had been working with the DeSantis team but we're not necessarily seeing that at the forefront of the coverage it's like oh wow this is casting a lot of doubt on trans affirming care for minors <laughs> so part of the reason why I have achieved success in my own writing on my own independent newsletter is because media typically ignores trans voices in the same way that the cast report ignored trans voices right specifically stop trans people from having a say in the ultimate production of this report, specifically stop people who handle our care from having a say in the ultimate production of this report. And so, yes, it is very hard to get this information out there. However, a number of people are starting to cover it, and myself, but you know, I have seen other people uh, start to mention this. Unfortunately, this is the playbook for how to ban trans care. This is what they do. If you want to ban trans care, you basically find somebody to look at all the evidence, say that it's not good enough, even though the evidence is in line with most adult and pediatric care, care that's out there. We, for instance, heard in Georgia, whenever the gender affirming care ban happened in Georgia here in the United States, 
uh, the judge looked at the claims that the evidence is not high quality enough and said, well, hold on. If you, if you held all medical care to this standard, which is an unreachable standard for so much care, you would have to eliminate 90% of all adult care and trans care and youth care that isn't even trans, pediatric care out there. And so, yeah, that's what we're seeing. I mean, it doesn't even cite some of these very well-established studies, like in Lancet, the numbers on uh, uh, care being continued for children as teens that are going through uh, transition care, where it's basically around 97, 97 percent continue care after starting after five. I mean, did they even do they did that's that's not included? <laughs> actually, actually, here's the funny thing that is included. And let me explain to you why it's funny. They took that study and said, wait, hold on, 97.5% of trans people are, are still stable in their gender identity five years later, meaning that people aren't regretting being trans. People are who they are. We Trans people exist, we know who we are. So she, she looked at that study and she said, oh, well, what's actually happening here is that once they socially transition or once they take puberty blockers, they're locked into their gender identity. Now, now you can imagine. That's the study, that study she was yeah, yeah. citing? That's that is, that is hilarious. Now, now, you can imagine that if that study found that 50% of the kids were stopping identifying as trans after they started taking puberty blockers, she would then say, oh, well, this proves that detransition is high and that, you know, we shouldn't give care. It's a catch-22. There is no way to win. And so these faux reviews that keep on coming out from these anti-trans governmental sources or these anti-trans organizations, they build the consensus by looking at the evidence in the worst possible light and then portraying that out to society. I mean, so can, so basically she dis dismissed the overwhelming figure there by saying that you can't really count it because they had already begun their care. Oh, uh, she, she dismissed it because she said that because they had begun their care, that that somehow traps them as being trans. Okay. Um, and this is, I mean, it's it's actually incredible how how uh, BS-filled this this review is. And the other part is that they, uh, she, she cited, uh, and you, you wrote about this in your piece again, that people should all read, these outdated desistance uh, rates, if you don't mind explaining uh, that part. Absolutely. And... This is one of the things that I always look for in a report to determine if they are engaging with the science properly. And one of the things I look for is, are they going to cite Zucker? Are they going to cite this idea that 80% of trans youth who identify as trans later on say, I'm not trans anymore. I regret it. I don't want it. I don't want this. If they cite Zucker, I know that they're not engaging with it in good faith because Zucker was a um, therapist in the 1990s in Canada. He operated a clinic where you would bring your kid and they didn't have to be trans. It could just be like an effeminate gay boy. It could be a tomboy. You bring your kid in and say, there's something wrong with my kid. They're acting like a sissy or there's something wrong with my kid. You know, they're a tomboy and like they're not doing gender right. And Zucker would then come in and say, yeah, you're right. There's something wrong. Let's go ahead and pull the, pull the toys away. Let's go ahead and tell you that you have to have same sex friends. You can't be playing with kids of the opposite sex. All of these things were things that Zucker's clinic did. It was essentially a form of aversive conversion therapy, saying that uh, you know you you heap praise whenever they're doing their gender properly, you uh, punish them, or you take things away from them whenever they're not doing it properly. And so he wrote that this approach managed to result in eighty percent of trans youth desisting. It wasn't even trans youth; it was people with gender identity disorder, which covered again a sissy boy, as they would call it back then. That is literally right. the words that they used. And so um, this is essentially saying that conversion therapy is potentially how we should be handling trans youth, that these people are being conflated with one another, and that this is a this is a good study, whenever it is not. There have been many attempts to, uh, or many, many, or uh, papers have pointed out how poor the study was. Well, the New York Times had that opinion uh, piece, right, where they, <laughs> they, um, cited the study and that was that came under a lot of uh fire for that very reason um and the other part that was just uh, stunning to me is that the report cites a republican u.s based anti-trans uh youtube page can you talk a bit about that yeah that was a wild finding that i didn't catch the first time that i had read the report but it suddenly came out online that the report was uh 
the report was citing a source that was it was this it was just a YouTube page, just like a straight up YouTube page to say um, to to like portray something about what happened at one of the WPATH. Uh, one of the WPATH meetings. And whenever you actually go onto the YouTube page, uh, which is uh, thoughts on things and stuff is the actual name of the YouTube page. God, if you ever type that into to YouTube, like thoughts on things and stuff, and you look at what's there, it's going to be nothing but just like horrific, like transphobic memes. You see gays against groomer. You see things about the Florida report, which was again done uh, alongside with Dr. Hillary Cass. And so, yeah. That's that's there. Yeah, it's in I'm, the report. It is cited as evidence in this big medical report that's supposed to be neutral and unbiased. And and can you talk a bit about uh, or expand on the parts where they basically imply that being trans uh, could be contagious? Yeah. So there's this one section of the report where Dr. Cass says that there is evidence that kids are making friends with other kids who are transgender and then suddenly identifying as transgender themselves. The idea is that if you are even friends with us, you might turn trans. I promise you after this meeting today, after our video today, you're not gonna turn trans. You're gonna go well, home. Well, to be fair to them, Aaron, we're not in the same room, so I wasn't able to inhale yeah, your you're trans right. you, you did not, trans you did not particles. inhale my, my trans particles and it didn't right. turn your turn you trans. Yep. Uh, no, this is something that doesn't have evidence. And, and I think that what's really important about this step, part of the report is that she talks about levels of evidence to make claims about trans care. And you have all of these high standards to make those claims. And then yet, whenever it's time to talk about me turning you trans, there's no evidence. There's nothing to back that up. And she puts it in the report. And so it just goes to show that you can write these reports with double standards and make it in such a way to where you're basically building consensus. You're trying to build a reason for the politicians to now come in and say, you're doing exactly what we want you to do. We're going to go ahead and ban that care. So, I mean... <clears throat> right. Uh, what is the political situation in England right now as it relates to responding to this report? I mean, the, the Tories are in trouble next election cycle, but they're the conservatives are still in control of the government or uh, right as of right now, if I'm not mistaken. So um, are they going to take action based on this? Yeah, they're already taking action based on this. They're already talking about how they're banning puberty blockers, they're restricting hormone therapy, they're telling private clinics that they can't provide the care anymore. There's gonna be some legal battles over this. It's gonna be horrifying because unlike in the United States where if one state bans care, we can go to another state to get that care. If this happens you know, in England and if this happens in the UK, it's gonna be very hard to access that care. I will say that this doesn't change too much because up to this point, it, the wait list for five to 10 years anyway. That's how bad trans care is in the UK. But the principle of the matter is that this is now gonna be used to justify bans in other states. We're already seeing the Heritage Foundation in the United States. We're already seeing the Alliance Defending Freedom, the Christian School Network International, all of these groups are citing it to brief the, the different courts in their states. And they're gonna use this as rationale to continue to try to ban care everywhere. Well, um, I really appreciate you taking the time to to uh, educate us on this and reading that infuriating report. Erin uh, Reed, you can uh, subscribe to her Substack. Erin in the morning, we'll put a link to uh, that in the description wherever you're listening to or watching this. And at majority.fm. Thanks so much for your time today, Erin. I really appreciate Thank it. Thank you for having me on. For sure. All right, guys, with that, we are going to wrap up the first hour of this program and head into the fun half. The number is 646-257-3920. Um, on ESVN this week, uh, we had a, a pretty big show where we previewed the... Uh, the Whoa. Uh, we, pre we have Brandon soon. Um, we previewed the play-in tournament, and it's going not as I anticipated. I thought Golden State would win, but wow, it was sad to see them go out like that. It um, washed. Yeah. It was, I mean, Clay. Yeah, 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 yeah. He's going to look good uh, as the second guy off the bench for the Timberwolves next year. Oh, 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 oh I'm sure, Matt. I'm sure. Um, uh, we, we just previewed the M uh, NBA play and a little outdated oh, yeah. now, but we also talked about the NHL playoffs and that extremely exciting finish to the season. Um, 
And what else do we talk about, Bradley? We uh, Should we talk about Jante. Was that out yet? Aaron, not yet. We'll we'll cover that next week. We're gonna do Tuesday because Bradley's going to a Passover celebration. So for people anticipating our uh, our ESVN coverage, we're gonna do it on Tuesday next week. Um, but we also talked about that Aaron Rodgers stuff had some fun and the uh, Arizona Coyotes moving to Utah. More billionaire malfeasance forcing a uh, franchise out of a city that actually wanted it to stay. So. Um, youtube.com slash ESVN show for that. Um, Matt, what's happening on Left Reckoning? Uh, yeah, uh, Left Reckoning, we had a Saul Radon to uh, talk about Iran's uh, strike on Israel. And uh, also we got into something we're going to probably talk about hopefully in this fun half, which is Elon Musk uh, and the <laughs> Tesla truck absolutely uh, killing it uh, in, the, in the kind of derogatory <laughs> sense of Killing that. people? No. Uh, <laughs> or uh, Elon Musk's maybe uh, sort of reputation. I don't know. That that thing is like that guy in um, Monty Python, like uh, the flesh wound sort of knight. That's, uh, but apparently still chugging along and getting mayors to be like, hey, do you want to bore stuff? Anyway, patreon.com says left reckoning. Hey, Brandon. Hey, you know, some of my favorite topics. I love Elon. I love hearing about new sports teams. Uh, I feel like Emma, every time you talk about your show, like you mentioned a sports team I have never heard of, like the Arizona Coyotes. And I'm yeah, saying, that's it's like an, a, it's an like NHL a, team, the Desert oh, Dogs. Oh, hockey. Oh, yeah. I know what a coyote is. It doesn't yeah. tell me. <laughs> no, I mean, yeah, it, it, uh, <laughs> it's odd because you would think that hockey is not compatible with Phoenix, Arizona, but they actually have somewhat of a fan base. Um, and some of the yeah. better NHL players like Austin Matthews came out of uh, the Arizona minor scene. So anyway, but now they're moving to Salt Lake City because a billionaire didn't get the taxpayer money he wanted to fund his own stadium. So um, ain't that just the way I was going to say, I could imagine it being po uh, popular in Arizona because people can go watch a game inside air conditioned, you know, yeah. what, what more do you want? Like, yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. It's like 120 degrees out there. Arizona hockey may not be great for the environment, but um, <sighs> Brandon, what's happening over on uh, the discourse? We'll have a new episode for you out this weekend where we talked about Israel's strike on Iran, the possible consequences of that, you know, and the various sort of fallouts that we're seeing domestically regarding this our uh, continued support of this genocide and then also I will have my special episode out where I talk about one of my favorite movies unfortunately I've committed the cardinal sin of talking about a movie for a podcast where the podcast becomes longer than the movie itself um, so <laughs> so I'm gonna have to do some heavy editing or maybe I won't but now that I've warned you you can't complain <laughs> That's how it works. All right, check that out. Uh, Mappender, hello to you. Um, hello. What's happening over on your programs? Sure. So uh, youtube.com slash Mappender. Go there. Did a great show last night. Talked about uh, everything that happened this week. Took listener calls. It's all there. Check it out. YouTube.com slash Mappender. Doomedcast.com. And uh, happy birthday, Emma. Thank you very much. We'll have a little bit of a celebration maybe in the fun half. Have some fun. Um, 646-257-3920. See you there. Three months from now, six months from now, nine months from now, and I don't think it's going to be the same as it looks like in six months from now, and I don't know if it's necessarily going to be better six months from now than it is three months from now, but I think around 18 months out, we're going to look back and go like, Wow. What? What is that going on? It's nuts. Wait a second. Hold on. For, hold on for a second. The on Emma, welcome to the program. Hey. On Matt. Who? On what is up, everyone? On Know me, Keen. You did it. On Let's Point go, there. Brandon. Let's go, Brandon. On Bradley, you want to say hello? Uh, sorry to disappoint everyone. I'm just a random guy. It's all the boys today. Fundamentally false. No, I'm sorry. Women's Stop talking oh, for wow. a second. Now let me finish. Where is this coming from, dude? But, dude, uh, you want to smoke this? Um, Seven, eight. Yes. Hi, me? This me? Yes. Uh, is this me? Is it me? It is you. Is this me? Hello? Is this me? I think it is you. Who is you? Oh, no sound. Every single 
freaking day. What's on your mind? Sports. We can discuss free markets and we can discuss capitalism. I'm going to go start Who libertarian? They're so stupid, though. Common sense says, of course. Gobbledygook. We fucking nailed him. So what's 79 plus 21? Challenge man. I'm positively quivering. I believe 96, I want to say. 857-210-35-501-1-half. 9-11, for instance. $3,400. $1,900. $6,543 trillion sold. It's a zero-sum game. Actually, you're making me think less. But, but let me say this. Poop. <laughs> you call it satire. Sam goes, it's satire. On top of it all, yeah. my favorite part about yeah. you is just like every day, all day, like yeah. everything you do. Without a doubt. Hey, buddy, we see you. <laughs> all right, folks. 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 It's just the week being weeded out, obviously. Yeah. Sun's out, guns out. I, I I don't know. But you should know. The, People the, just don't like to entertain ideas anymore. Anyway. I have a question. Who cares? Our chat is enabled, wow. folks. I love it. I do love that. Look, gotta jump. Gotta be quick. I gotta jump. I'm losing it, bro. Um, Two o'clock. We're already late, and the guy's being a dick. So screw him. Um, um, sent to a gulag? Outrageous. Like, what is wrong with you? Love you, bye. Love you. Bye-bye. We are back, and I'm having a little bit of white wine. That's my favorite drink. Very nice. I'm very, very much a a white lady. I can't even call myself a girl anymore now that I'm 30. <laughs> oh, that's right. Happy birthday. I'm a white, white matron. Um, yeah, 30 is the end of being able to play off the whole, oh, I'm just a, a wee lad, a wee lass. Totally. Just a I, girl. I, I, did, I disagree. Oh, be nice I'm, to me. I'm just, just a little desert mouse. <laughs> Again, I, I am. Moadib. Just a boy. Moadib. Um, Anyway, uh, so what should we do here, folks? Maybe let's just take a call really quickly, get our bearings. Yeah, yeah um, take a call. I'll look at the sound sheet. Sounds good to me. All right. That's exactly uh, what I'm going to do as well. All right. Calling from an 816 area code. Who's this? 